Good morning, everybody. How's it going? Have a good, good conference? Well, thanks for coming to my talk. Today, we're going to be talking about BigQuery and open data, because open data is fun to play with. But before we get into BigQuery, what it is, what it does, why it's awesome, let me tell you a little bit about me, just for a moment. I'm Jen. I'm a security advocate at Google, which means I'm a software engineer by background, and now I spend my time helping people stay out of trouble while they use the cloud. And occasionally, I'll dabble with big data stuff, which is why I'm talking to you about BigQuery today. I always love hearing from people, so if I can ever answer any questions about Google stuff, particularly APIs or developer-centric stuff, drop me a ping. That's my Twitter handle. It's the best way to reach me. Uh, the slides are also up. There's a bunch of code in there, so you might want it at some point. I'll share that link at the end also. So here is our agenda for today. We're going to take just a minute to talk about data and kind of the abstract. Then we're going to count things, because counting things is fun. Then I'll explain to you how that counting things part worked. And we'll finish off with something useful. Sound like a plan? Yay! OK. So first, let's spend a minute or two talking about data in the abstract with a picture from that movie from a long time ago. So we all have lots of data now. It's cheaper than ever to like, aggregate all of the data that matters to our business. Disks are cheap, and you know, even tape is still around. But a problem I ran into a lot when I was doing non advocacy work is getting insights out of that data was hard. You, know, you got your big lake of data, or whatever it's called now. But I can't think of how many times I spent a month building out a dashboard only to discover that it didn't actually give me useful information. And that was a really big bummer, because I wasted a month of time. I could have been spent coding something else. And Google's been dealing with some of those problems for a long time. We have a lot of data. We've had a lot of data for a long time. So much so that when you think of Google, you probably think of this. But a lot of people inside Google, myself included, think of this. All of the different infrastructure and all the different software that goes towards making that search engine and all of the other Google products work as well as they do. So along the way, we encounter a lot of big data problems early on in the industry. And we came up with some interesting ways to solve them. We thought they were neat. And we're kind of we're geeky. So we shared those ideas with the world in the way we're comfortable by publishing math papers, obviously. And we continue to this, this trend. We continue to publish a lot of our innovations in terms of uh, by publishing research papers in computer science and math journals. And one thing that's kind of cool is when you publish papers, people who think they're a good idea will go back and write code that implements your papers. And it's kind of cool to see like, a whole ecosystem of different open source projects rise from a lot of our published works. And that's great, because then people can solve problems that we've already faced, and they don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. But not all of the details of our implementations made it into our research papers. There's only so much you can put in one of those papers. And we liked a lot of the details of our own implementations. And we continued to add features after those papers were published. So they, they diverged a little from the open source projects. So as Google invests more in its cloud platform, we decided to take a lot of those internal systems that we developed, give them a nice fancy hexagon logo with a pretty little white object inside, so you can put it in your architectural diagrams. Maybe give it a new, more brand-friendly name, and then make it available as a paid service. So we have lots of our infrastructure that we use to power things like Gmail and Search, and now those are available as managed databases and, and things like that. And I'd love to spend time going through all of those, but I have about 15 minutes left. So we're going to spend the rest of the talk talking about just one of them, BigQuery. And BigQuery is a tool for not wasting time building the wrong dashboard, essentially. It's a way to quickly get insight from structured data that you have a lot of. I could tell you a whole lot about what it can do and its capabilities, but I'd rather just show you. So we're going to do some demos. BigQuery, you interact with it using SQL, because SQL is much more fun to work with than MapReduce. At least I think so, although MapReduce is pretty cool too. But it turns out not everyone at, at Google agreed, so we, we use SQL for a lot of stuff. So let's go ahead, and we're going to copy this query. 
We're going to go to BigQuery. This is a web interface, which is useful for prototyping. Although, honestly, if you're really using it, you're probably going to be interacting with it via like ODBC or JDBC or the, the, the APIs. But I'm just going to drop it in here so we can see it. And we're going to do kind of the hello world of big data. We're going to count the words in Shakespeare. So we're going to run our query. We're going to make sure that caching is off, because caching being on would be cheating. So let's hide those options, run that query again. And we can see that we processed about 1.2 megabytes of data in 1.6 seconds, which actually seems kind of slow when you think about it. Like I can just use like word count and grep to do that a lot faster just from flat files on my computer. But BigQuery really shines in that it's kind of flat across data sizes. So if we leave the world of classic literature and go take a look at an hour of Wikipedia logs, one of my favorite open data sets to play with, we can count all of the requests that Wikipedia saw in an hour in 2015. And it turns out about 39 million requests. For this one, we processed 46 megabytes of data in three seconds. But you know what's cooler than a million? A billion. So let's count about a month of data. So here we go. This one runs for about 3.3 seconds. It processes 1,000 times more data, 43 gigabytes. And we counted, we aggregated 21 billion requests of, of data. But you know what's cooler than a billion? A trillion. So let's go ahead and run a bigger query over all of the data from 2015 that I bothered to download. And this one will also run for pretty fast, a little bit longer. This one took about 5.8 seconds. And the query scanned 497 gigabytes of data. And we accumulated about 286 billion requests of data, which is not quite a trillion. But uh, Wikipedia stopped publishing their, their request logs for a while uh, in 2016. So that's about as big as I can get from a year of data. But you know what would be really crazy? Let's run a regular expression on every row in that data set. So we have that 286 billion requests worth of data. And, but dinosaurs, so not relevant. I need something relevant to this event. So let's search for trailhead, case insensitive. And of course, case insensitive D. So what we're going to do now is this query aggregates all of the requests for all of Wikipedia traffic. And it's checking each title of each article to see if it can matches that regular expression. This one scans a lot more data because in addition to looking at the request counts, it's also looking at the boop, it's also looking at the titles themselves. So this request is processing about 3.5 terabytes of data. It takes a little bit longer. And I have a few seconds here because I think this one will take close to a minute. Incidentally, BigQuery bills by the amount of data you scan, which is why I keep popping up that number. This is about a $17 query to answer based on the standard billing rate. And we discover, after spending that $17, that 76,633 requests in 2015 on Wikipedia were for articles that contained trailhead in the title. So if you, if you have an urgent question to answer and you don't want to build a dashboard, you can answer that for about $17 in under a minute, 34 seconds. OK. So we just counted a whole bunch of stuff. How the heck does that work? Databases don't usually work quite like that. They're not slow for small data and fast for huge data. And that's because this is not a relational database. It may look like a database because we put in SQL, but it is not a relational database at all. That's because like, relational databases are about mutating data over time. So you can do like transactions and change stuff. This is all focused on processing data that's generally static once it's written, like appending data like logs and things like that. So in a normal database where I'd spend a lot of time like spending thinking about indexing and locking and caching and like query planning to bring all that stuff together, we decided not to do any of that for BigQuery because it, it's hard. And we had a different problem set. Instead, the, the speed from BigQuery comes from disks. It turns out that disks are pretty fast, especially when combined with a whole lot of friends. So a typical BigQuery is going to spin about 5,000 disks at the same time. 
And it turns out renting like 5,000 disks for one second costs about the same as renting one disk for 5,000 seconds, but you get the answer way faster uh, in the first use case. And this is kind of one of the general advantages of cloud computing. You get all these opportunities for like massive resource sharing where you can get your spiky loads for just the cost of that spike instead of having to pay for that infrastructure all the time. Additionally, we're not changing the data. Generally, data for BigQuery is write once and then read many times. So instead of storing the data as rows when we process a table for a relational database, we rotate it 90 degrees and we store it as columns. So when you stream your data in or you upload a big file, we're going to break it up into columns. And this gives us two advantages. First is that we only query the columns that are in your query. So select stars are kind of expensive, but selecting a few columns is much cheaper. The other benefit is it gives us much more compression because the data that resides in the same column tends to be pretty similar to the, the row above and below it. And that gives us a lot of compression. And we don't care so much about saving space because space is cheap, but the more compression we get, the faster we can get that data streaming off of those disks. And then we take those compressed columns and we spread it out across all of the disks in that infrastructure so that we can read them all in parallel, kind of like a, a super crazy RAID array, except implemented in software. So, boop. So that is, that is how BigQuery works in a nutshell. There's more to it, but time is limited. And I want to show you that you can actually use this to do something useful. It, does more than just count requests on Wikipedia. You can take any data source, like all data sources in BigQuery are kind of generally globally available. So you can take any open data, like Wikipedia data, and you can join it with any other data. So for example, your own private corporate data, you could join with, you know, across your, your, your corporate data, across your data lake. Um, you can also join that up with open data sets, any data set on the world that you have permissions to access. So we're going to use Wikipedia data. We're going to join it with ourself, because open data is, is what I have access to for this demo. And then I'm going to turn Wikipedia data into a recommendation for a movie to watch. And we're going to do that by following the editors. So request logs on Wikipedia are anonymous, but editor logs are not. They actually keep track of who edits which Wikipedia articles to like, prevent abuse and just have a, a chain of edits on pages. So if I look at a particular movie page, I can look at everybody who edited it, and then I can look at all the other movies they also edited, rank them, you know, just order them, and then that will probably give me an idea for a movie I might want to watch. And this is something that would take me quite a while to implement in pure software. Let's, let's see how easy it is in, in, in BigQuery. So the first thing we're going to need to do is pick a movie. We're going to pick the film Hackers, the best movie ever filmed. And we're going to go look up its kind of internal identifier, mostly just so I can keep the, the, the query smaller. I'm just going to go grab the identifier. So this process is about 11 gigs of data. And it tells me the Hackers, the film, has the ID 264176. And this ID persists across the lifetime of that article, past title changes, and all that kind of stuff. So now that I know the article, uh, the identifier of the article, I can run this query, which looks kind of big, but actually is just very nested. So what's happening here is I have an inner select where I'm finding all of the editors for Hackers the Movie, and then I'm filtering out like automatic rollbacks and discussion page edits. Like, open data has a lot of weird corners, so I'm kind of rounding off those clear weird corners. And then I'm taking that, and I'm doing a, an in operation, a join, with the same set of editors, except now I'm looking at everybody who edited every film that is not Hackers the movie. Or, or rather, I'm finding all the films that are not Hackers that were also edited by that same pool of people. And this is great. It processed about the same amount of data, because BigQuery's smart about, you know, we're selecting the same columns, so it's pretty good about reusing them. And here's the result that it comes up with. Boop. These are the, the most commonly edited things. And one thing you'll find that's a little bit weird, make it a little smaller so you can see more of them, is no matter what movie you put into this, Fight Club always comes up as the most edited film by people who edit any other movie on Wikipedia. It turns out that there are some films that are just very controversial. 
and people just constantly get in edit wars on it. So we got we to gotta adjust for that. So we're going to make another small query. What this query does is it goes and finds the most controversial films on Wikipedia, the ones that there's the most edit wars for. And it's finding the top 20 films that have the most edits and gives me back a list of IDs. So then I can take those two queries and combine them together into one giant query, which I swear is a lot easier to write than it is to read. But it's essentially all of the controversial films being subtracted from that list of common edits we found earlier. So I run that query, processes the same 13 gigs of data, and a few seconds later, it gives me a list of films I might want to check out. And what's cool is these films all have Wikipedia pages. So when I first ran this query, a film came up that I didn't recognize, and it was Mystery Train. So let's go take a look at it. Let's go find the Wikipedia page. And it is a 1989 independent anthology film that had a $2.8 million budget. So not the kind of film that I, I'm going to find through a lot of other you know, affinity algorithms. Like This is something that the film junkies seem to think I would like if I liked Hackers the movie. And it turns out it actually is a movie I like a lot. The recommendation totally worked. And it is not something I would have discovered otherwise. Boop. So wrapping up, we all have a whole bunch of data we're accumulating. Most of us are just stashing it away for now. A lot of that data is tabular, and we just don't have the resources or the time to figure out what we want, what insights we want to pull from that. Because it's, it's hard. We don't have the tooling to, to pull it up right away. And that's where a lot of cloud database products or things like BigQuery can come in like, really handy. They're an ability to kind of dig into that data really rapidly, figure out if the answers are worth solving, and then maybe build you know, a more efficient dashboard uh, downstream, or just use BigQuery and cache the data. A lot of people do that too. So this is just a taste of BigQuery. I only scratched the surface. There's a whole bunch of features beyond this. There's also a whole bunch of really cool open data sets we make available for you to play with. And it's also the first five gigs of BigQuery usage every month for each user are free. So you can go in and give it a spin right away, play with some big data. And you can also use the queries I had in this talk, although be aware that the the regular expression on Wikipedia data will, will burn through all of that quota. Sorry? Yeah, go ahead and get scanned if you'd like a follow up. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm going to leave you with one last note, but we'll have about a minute for questions. Is if you are interested in other Google Cloud stuff, Check out Google Cloud Next. It will be at Moscone in the future, in July. And the early bird tickets are still available. And if you'd like to discuss anything else about what I talked about here or other Google Cloud stuff, we have a booth like right over there. I'll be hanging out there for the rest of the day. I'd love to chat. So with 90 seconds left, does anybody have any questions? No questions. OK, well, I will be hanging out at the booth. Please feel free to swing by. And thanks a lot for hanging out. Thank you.